Hello everyone and welcome back to our third session in today's open workflows theme. Um, we were hearing, seeing here some demonstrations of, of some software and processes. Um, as previously, we've got our contact uh, information on the bottom of this slide here. You can catch us on our website if you'd like to know more about the speakers or the program. Um, if you're on Twitter, you can find us on there, OHBM Open. And if you're using Mattermost, we've got a general discussion channel and also a theme specific discussion channel, OSR Workflows. So uh, as Gas said, today is open workflows and this specific session is about demonstrations, both processes and software. And we're gonna look at tools for building robust and reproducible pipelines and what our community has been working on. So we are, we'll have four talks, each of seven minutes, and then we'll have a 20 minute Q&A session uh, with um, uh, some of the speakers. We'll, we'll try to get um, all speakers available for that live session, but only some of them might be available in um, this particular time zone. So we will be using Crowdcast for our main Q&A, our live Q&A at the end of the session. If you have questions during the talks, you can post them in the OHBM platform if you're joining us from there, or you can post them in Crowdcast as well. If you're in Crowdcast, please remember to upvote each other's questions. We'd love to see what kind of questions you want answered. And to continue the discussion after the session is over, please use the Mattermost channel and tag the speakers if you can. And at the end of the session on Crowdcast, we'll have a poll. Um, we'd love to gather your feedback about how much you've enjoyed this event and how relevant you found the topics and the speakers. So please do fill in that poll and um, remember we love data. Um, and finally, we'd like to remind you all that you have agreed to abide by the OHBM code of conduct. In general, that means treating each other with kindness and respect. Um, if you experience or witness any violations of that code of conduct, please do follow the reporting structure that's outlined in the document on the OHBM website. So it's my pleasure to welcome the speakers for the demonstrations in the Open Workflows um, theme. Firstly, we'll have Adina Wagner and she will speak to us about reproducible resource objects with DataLad. Eric Werner will then continue with Open Re Reproducible and Decentralized Workflows with CoinStack. Our third demonstration will be from uh, David Muni, and he will speak about Macapipe, which is an open multi-software framework for non-human primate anatomical MRI processing. And our last demo will be from Mats van S, who will show us no effort fully reproducible analysis code with Filtrop. So we're very excited to hear from all of you, and we're also very excited to interact with our global community during these talks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adina, and today I'm going to demonstrate a data-led centric analysis workflow. The funniest part of this demonstration is that the speech recognition is really bad at transcribing data-led. I will try not to laugh too much about this, but you can go ahead and have fun. If you're already familiar with data-led, you will see many concepts you're already aware of, but I will also include some highlights of the most recent data-led 013 release. For anyone who's new to data-led, here's the gist. DataLed is a comprehensive data management and data publication multi-tool. It is available for all of major operating systems, and it comes with a command line client and a Python API. DataLed is built on the version control tools Git and Git Annex, and among its major features are version control for contents of any sites, reproducible and fair analysis tools, or publication routines that interface with major third-party services. So you can learn more about DataLed and what it can do for you at the DataLed Handbook at handbook.datalet.org. In my demonstration today, I will walk through an analysis workflow with data consumption of a bit-structured subset of the Human Connectome Project via DataLed, a data analysis with a containerized pipeline, in this case it's FMI prep, and the publication of results with their provenance in a publicly accessible repository. For my demonstration, I'm using DataLed version 013 and the DataLed extension DataLed contains. So you can find instructions on how to install DataLed and its extensions in the DataLed handbook. When using DataLed, everything happens in a dataset. A dataset is the directory on your computer that is managed by DataLed. On a technical level, a dataset is a Git Git Annex repository. 
and data sets can version control their contents, they can be shared if they're installed, and they can be nested in order to link them. When I want to perform an analysis, then I start by creating an empty data set with a data let create command, just as the one that you can see in the slides. When using data led for an analysis project, I adhere to a set of principles that result in a modular project structure. I create data analysis data sets that hold the results and the code. Uh, consumer create what I call toolbox data sets with containerized and appropriately configured analysis pipelines. And I link all relevant data sets as sub data sets of my analysis. One of the analysis components is data. DataLet makes it really easy to install data, and the 013 release comes with some even more exciting features for data consumption. For example, you can install the HCP data as a DataLet dataset now directly from GitHub. We are also in the wake of creating subsets of the HCP data and transform them into bits like formats. The newly introduced feature of so called RIA stores makes it possible to install such HC HCP data subsets in specific versions. And here you can see me installing a subset of HCP data that has been transformed into a bits like format from a public data led RIA store. From my experiences, data that scales well. Computations that produce one to 200,000 files comfortably fit into a single data set. With an analysis that is bigger than this, I simply split my data set by including sub data sets for results. The fMRI prep preprocessing pipeline I'm demonstrating today could produce about 500,000 files, and therefore I'm splitting the outputs between an fMRI prep and a free server sub data set. Here you can see that I install empty pre created data sets as sub data sets for this, and my fMRI prep preprocessing will later populate those sub data sets with results. Here is how I would build a simple toolbox dataset that I can use for analysis projects of mine that use fMRI prep. I create a dataset, I uh, add relevant auxiliary files such as licenses to it, and I register a Docker or Singularity container with a pipeline I want to use. I can even configure a custom core specification uh, and can, for example, attach programmatic bind mounts to the container. You wouldn't necessarily need to build such a toolbox yourself, though, because there's already a vast amount of great uh, containerized pipelines publicly available in GitHub. Just as with data, I can link my toolbox dataset to my analysis. Note that I use the .tools name that I also specified as a bind mount in the container call specification before. With this procedure, I can create analysis datasets and run fMRI preps on the data whenever I want to, just by installing this as a sub dataset. With containerized pipeline and data setup, I can use the data led containers run command to execute fMRI prep preprocessing on my data. This command will retrieve and use the container in my toolbox, retrieve any input data that I specify, and execute the command I gave to it inside of the container. Here, uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm preprocessing a single subject. The results of this will be saved into the sub data sets, and I will get a machine readable and re executable run record from this that allows me to rerun my analysis, for example, if my data has been updated, and also get a complete provenance record of where this data comes from. When my computations are done, then I can publish my results to make them publicly available. Depending on the audience I want to share my results with, publication platforms can differ. In this case, I want results to be publicly available, and therefore my publication target will be the repository hosting service GIN. Uh, GIN is a dataset hosting service with support for controlled and anonymous access to data. And if I publish my results to public GIN repository, others can clone the dataset and retrieve its contents without having to have an account in GIN even. For this, I first create a new repository on GIN using its web interface. Next, I add this empty repository as a sibling to my dataset. Here I call this sibling origin. And finally, I can publish all datasets and their contents recursively from the top level dataset. Uh, here I'm using data like push to publish all of them. On GIN afterwards, um, I or others can now access this dataset, the re executable run record, and the results in the sub datasets. You can take a look for yourself if you want to, and for example, retrieve data. Um, retrieving data works via anonymous HTTP access without even a GIN account using DataLet clone and a subsequent DataLet get on whatever content you want to obtain. And in order to recompute results, I could use the DataLet rerun command to rerun the computations I have done before. This concludes my short demonstration already.
You can check out the DataNet handbook to find out about the details of what I've just shown you. And if you want to contribute or if you need help, then please get in touch. Let me end by ending by thanking the creators and contributors of DataNet and the wonderful contributors of the DataNet handbook. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hello, my name is Eric Werner, and I'm with the Center for Translational Research in Neuroimaging and Data Science in Atlanta, Georgia. Today, I'd like to talk to you about open and reproducible and decentralized workflows with CoinStack. Okay, we're rolling on this one here. Now, as scientists, I'm sure you all understand the benefits of data sharing. First, it can increase the visibility of your work. Two, it can increase public transparency of your work and allow for reuse of your data. Third, it helps you build better models by using more diverse data sets. However, there are many obstacles to data sharing. The first is intellectual property or confidentiality issues. Next is the fear of being scooped. People don't want to, want to receive credit for their work and they don't want others to use their work to, to benefit. Third, is misuse and misrepresentation of data. Fourth is preserving subject privacy, which is very important. And last might be you just might, may not have the permission of your institution. For all these reasons, we invented CoinStack, the Collaborative Informatics and Neuroimaging Suite Toolkit for Anonymous Computation. It enables analyses without sharing, and it lets you collaborate with researchers all around the world. You can run both neuroimaging pre-processing and run advanced statistical and machine learning analyses. We also have differentially private computations to protect against re-identification. Our application is a standalone electron-based application. It has a user-friendly interface and it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. With CoinStack, you can run open and reproducible workflows. It's all the software is open source and free. You, and all of the computations work inside, work, are run inside of a Docker container. So they, you can use any programming language, including C++, R, or Python, or even MATLAB. And because of this, our containers are in all of our, all the, everything that's done in CoinStack is introspectable, meaning you can go inside to and read each line of code to see exactly what happened. And not only that, you'll have identical workflows on every site that, that joins in your analysis. And you can see that in this figure that you specify what the computation is on GitHub, then create a Docker container and push your, push your image to Docker Hub. Then you push your Docker container. When, when it's time to run your computation on CoinStack, you pull the, the container with your computation onto each site and then run it. Then let me walk you through how a typical example goes with CoinStack. This is from a more abstract level. The first step is setup. The setup, first the creator specifies the model. You can see that the creator is in the black box and is one of the sites that it will participate in the analysis. The other two sites are also participating, but do not define the model. On the left, you see in the brown box is the central aggregator node. Now first, the computation creator assigns the model, in this case, which is a brain volume versus age and whether a subject is a control or a patient. First, the, the, model, the creator sends the model to the central aggregator, then the central node sends the model structure to each, to each site. Then after that, each site maps their own data to the, to the variables in the computation. The next step is fitting. In fitting, each site, after the computation is kicked off, each site runs its own, creates its own model based on its own data. Then each site sends the fitted model back to the central node. The final step is aggregation, where the final node crunches all the data 
and then creates a combined global model, which is sent to each site. From there, each site can then compute the goodness of fit and compare the global model to their own data. And this is just a simple example using regression, but it gets more complicated with more advanced machine learning processes. Now here are, here are the computations that we currently have on CoinStack, um, including some, we also have others that are not listed, but here's our, our basic set. We have various types of regression on free surfer volumes and voxel-based morphometry maps. We also have pre-processing in vo using voxel-based morphometry or fMRI pre-processing. And then we've developed, we've implemented our the group ICA for fMRI toolbox as, uh, as CoinStack computations. This includes group ICA, dynamic functional connectivity pipeline, Mancova. Now, this allows you to, this is a, a very large suite of functional fMRI analyses. We also have decentralized TSNE, which is stochastic neighbor embedding to help visualize high dimensional data. And we have differentially private support vector machines for classification. Uh, here's an example of regression on VBM maps. On the left, you can see the, the beta weights for age, the constant, and for gender. And on the right, you can see the p-values. Now, one regression is run on each voxel and allows you to see both the significance and the effect size. So, and this is also a screenshot of the application. Next, we have dynamic functional connectivity. Now, you can see here we have a we have one of the independent components from the group ICA analysis, and then we have the we have a dynamic range, which is a spectral plot of the component, and we also have the spatial extent of the component across the brain. The last example I'm going to show you is decentralized t-stochastic neighbor embedding. And this allows you to visualize high dimensional data sets. You can see the, this is the classic MNIST data set, which is uh, classifying hand, or lots of pictures of handwritten digits. And each digit is then projected onto a 2D manifold. And you can see here, that each digit is clustered nicely in the same in a similar area. And you can see how the same could be done with brain volumes because they're very high dimensional. Now we we're looking for collaborators and we want people to work with us. You can create a computation or you can run a study with CoinStack, especially if you work with international collaborators and you're not able to share data. Furthermore, you can contribute to our code base, which is free and open source. If you're interested, please visit our GitHub page at github.com trendcenter slash coinstack or email me at everner at gsu.edu. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Hello, everybody. So I'm uh, David Meunier. I work at the, Institute Neuros at the Institute of Neuroscience de la Timone. So it's in Marseille, France. And I will present to you uh, the Macapai package, which is an open multi-software framework for non-human primate anatomical MRI processing. And this was done mostly with uh, a group of, uh, of people that work at IMT with, uh, with me. Uh, some of them are developers, some of them are experimentalists, and some of them are our supervisors. So why is a non-human primate MRI important for neuroscience? So MRI, most of the time, involves experimentation on human. So this is very developed, but not so much on the non-human primate. But there has been a growing interest lately uh, because uh, mostly one of the key reasons is that it allows for cross-species studies uh, very, very easily. Uh, and also one of the an important reasons is that uh, uh, MRI is non-invasive. So it's particularly important for compliance with uh, EU, European Union, or ERC uh, regulation on primate experimental research. So why is it difficult to do uh, non-human primate uh, 
MRI. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, different uh, topics that has to be uh, that has to be tackled. So first of all, it happens quite often that uh, acquisition is made in, for example, Sphinx position, which is not which is not the usual way of uh, human lying the scanner. So it requires some uh, reorientation. Also, another issue may come from the, that the brain uh, recorded may contain a lot of non-brain parts. The images recorded contain non-brain non -brain parts, in general the neck or uh, the thick head muscle. Another issue may come from a strong bias in the image because of the coil placement. And finally, most of the time when you require a template for segmentation, for example, in some very specific species, you have a low quality template. So there has been a lot of tools that has been developed to tackle these uh, different issues. But so far, there is no standardized pipeline that are available to do that. So Macapipe was developed in this purpose. And also, uh, you require flexibility in adding some uh, certain steps. So what is MacaPipe? So MacaPipe is based on the NIPipe. So NIPipe is a neuroimaging uh, framework that allows to use uh, lots of different softwares. So most, the most important, most widely used software, like such as FSL, SPN12, or AFNI. Uh, but, uh, but it wraps them in a common framework uh, using the Python uh, script. Uh, and uh, what is also interesting in NIPipe is the notion of pipelines or nodes. Uh, which is uh, which allow to design sequences that can be easily reused or recombined the way you want. So this is very flexible. And finally, this is there is lots of facilities for parallel processing. In particular, this is useful for big data sets. So MacaPipe functionalities that have, that we have developed involve a wrap of uh, lots of common neuroimaging processes, processing nodes that uh, wrap some of the common operation, such as the registration, bias correction, and normalization, brain extraction, segmentation. But also, we have wrapped some customized nodes for non-human primate processing, such as, for example, the script called Atlas Drex, which is a shell script and uh, for brain extraction. And also, we have developed a system of JSON files that allows to specify, to specify parameters for the whole pipeline, so general pipeline, but also if you want to specify general par some parameters for specific individuals or specific session, this is also possible to, to do. So here is an example of a pipeline that involves the data preparation. This is a pre-processing of the, of the data. So here you see that, for example, the same pipeline you use for T1 and T2 on the left and on the right of the image. So this is a graph that is generated by NIPI. And each of the pipeline for T1 and T2 involves denoising, which involves, which is a ounce-based uh, uh, functionality, then followed by uh, cropping. So this is a FSL uh, functionality. And then uh, an N4 debias, which involves, again, an ounce-based uh, functionality. And finally, we have the gathering of the, of the two results after the ounce-based, uh, after the N4 debias, which is the alignment on T1 of T1 and T2, so of T2 and T1, sorry, using FSL curve. So this is a good example of seeing how you can recombine and mix between standard and different standard tools and custom tools as well uh, using this, uh, this framework. So uh, you can also have more uh, useful advice on these steps in the Prime, uh, Prime Airy, uh wiki, which I give the address right now. So some results here. Sorry. So I, I have another pipeline actually I wanted to show, but it's not working anymore. Okay, I will skip that. Okay, so here I would like to show you some of the results that we have obtained. So this is on a macaque and involve uh, uh, a data set that we have been using also on another pipeline, which is, it didn't show here. Uh, but uh, uh, so the pipeline uses Atlas Brex, uh, I just mentioned before, to do the brain uh, extraction. So this is the result shown on the top uh, right uh, corner. And then you have uh, the pipeline on the, sorry, the Anthropos, which is a result of, which results in the segmentation that is at the bottom, bottom left. Uh, so you see this is a very nice result. And if I can get to the previous one, I don't know. 
Yes, okay, sorry. Uh, so here, this is uh, the same subject, but this, this time using, uh, so the registration is done in the template space this time. This is using the iterative flirt and uh, an iterative flirt and flirt to ensure that the template is correct, correctly, uh, uh, it, uh, the registration is correctly done. And uh, the brain extraction is done with the T1 and T2 contrast enhancement uh, bet extraction in FSL. And finally, you see, so this is done, this is what you see on the, on the, on the top uh, of the, on the image on the top. And you see also, we use the uh, old segment, so segmentation using SPM in the bottom on the, the template space, and this is the result on the same data. So you see this is different uh, template, sorry, different pipeline, but on the same data set. So I would like to insist on the fact that we use open source uh, we, we, we are very keen on uh, developing in open source. So Python, this is a Python package that is available both on GitHub and on, on uh, pip install. Uh, we emphasize the fact that we uh, ensure the good practice of open source development are, are set. For example, continuous integration, testing, coverage, template formatting, and we use pull request issue and milestone in GitHub to be to keep track of what we have been uh, doing. And also, this is preliminary, but still there is already a Docker image that is available uh, and a Docker file also. And finally, I would like to emphasize the future work that we wish to be developing. Uh, so one of the one first is the uh, ground truth. Uh, so for example requiring manual segmentation that would allow us to evaluate the quality of a different pipeline, whether there are, which are the best in different uh, settings of the acquisition, for example. So given that we have already a Docker image, we would like to make it a bit apps, which would make it very, very easy to use by uh, other, other people without having to install all the software we, we use. And finally, we will open very soon a forum or a chat called MapCapipe users, where people that want to use uh, MapCapipe will be welcome to ask if they have issues with install, if they want to see new, new segmentation or new pipeline that could be developed. So, Finally, uh, I would like to emphasize that we have uh, used uh, on we have tested on other species already, Marmoset and uh, and Baboon, and uh, but uh, they are preliminary results. So they are in my annex, and uh, but uh, if you have other pipeline uh, contribution, you can feel free to contribute with your own pipeline. And uh, and this is, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. My name is Mats van Hess from the Donners Institute, and I will demonstrate a tool as part of the Future Toolbox that generates a standardized reproducible analysis script from custom written MEG and EEG analysis code. So neuroscience currently faces the problem uh, that published results from neuroimaging data are often not reproducible. In part, this can be attributed to the fact that it is still not common for analysis pipelines including interactive and subjective analysis steps to be shared. So many analysis toolbox offer standardized analysis functions. Think of uh, FieldTrip, FSL, and m and &E Python. And researchers typically write study-specific code around these standardized functions in order to tailor the analysis to their study. But because most neuroscientists are actually not formally trained to develop code, uh, the study-specific code is often messy. It can be of limited quality, uh, can be badly documented, and it often includes dependencies that are not clear. Therefore, people might feel insecure to share their code, or it costs a lot of time to clean it up and to document it properly. This is one of the reasons why people don't share their code. We developed a solution to this problem in the Future Toolbox, which makes it easier to share your study-specific analysis pipeline. And FieldTrip is one of the most used toolboxes for electrophysiology data. The uh, solution in FieldTrip is a tool called Reproduce Script. And the Reproduce Script uh, configuration option in FieldTrip generates a standardized script plus all the intermediate data from your own custom written FieldTrip scripts. And the output script is a flattened version of your study specific code. And it is similar to how the online FieldTrip tutorials are formatted. So I will show, um, I will demonstrate this functionality in three demos. 
Uh, demo one is a single subject analysis. Demo two is, uh, involves multiple subjects. And demo three is a real life example. So I will now switch to MATLAB. Um, and first, the single subject analysis, we have three analysis steps, pre-processing and cleaning of MEG data, frequency analysis, and visualization. And this is all uh, present here in this uh, pipeline, in this script. So first, the pre-processing and cleaning, then frequency analysis, then plotting of the results. If we now want to uh, use reproduce script, we only have to initiate it at the top of the script. So this is the same, exact same code, but then including the reproduce script part. And we uh, use the FD default variable. This is a variable that is used by all filter functions, and it can be used to uh, specify global configuration options. And in this case, we turn on reproduce script by specifying the directory in which we want to save our, uh, our intermediate data and the standardized script. At the end of the pipeline, we turn off reproduce script by emptying this field. So if we now uh, run this pipeline, here you can immediately see that a reproduce folder is created. And now we wait a few seconds until uh, the pipeline is finished running. So the pipeline should create a, a figure. That's correct. And we click away this figure for now and we go to the reproduce folder. And this now contains all the intermediate data of this analysis pipelines and a standardized script. So if we open the script, we see that it contains the same calls to the same field trip functions as the original pipeline uh, and including pointers to the intermediate data that is saved in the same folder. Of course, this analysis pipeline is so simple that um, reproduce script was not really necessary to be used. But if we now go to a more complicated example, um, with multiple subjects. So we, we do the same, uh, we use the same analysis steps and we loop them over four subjects. And after that, we do a group analysis. And for each of these analysis steps, we uh, wrote a custom written uh, rep, uh, wrapper function on top of the field trip code. So that looks something like this. This is our entire pipeline now. We first define our subjects, then we loop over our subjects and we um, execute the following functions. First, do pre-processing and cleaning, which looks like this. Do frequency analysis and do plot frac. After this loop, we do group analysis, also in a wrapper function, which averages the data across subjects and then visualize it. If we want to use reproduce script, again, the only thing we have to specify uh, uh, on top of it is um, the folder in which we want to uh, save our reproduced results. And at the end of the pipeline, we turn this off again by emptying this field. And I already uh, ran this pipeline and it uh, produced this reproduce folder. And this reproduce folder now contains a lot of intermediate data and one standardized script that is a flattened version of the original pipeline containing all the single analysis steps that are necessary to be executed. Note that this standardized script is quite long, but reproduce script can be turned on and off flexibly. So we could have chosen to specify a unique reproduce script directory for each single subject analysis uh, and one for the group analysis. Now, demo three. In demo three, we used, a, uh, we used reproduce script to reproduce the results of a recently published pipeline by Lau Anderson. And on the right, you can see that this is a complex pipeline, including many wrapper functions on top of field trip code. With reproduce script, we made this uh, pipeline reproducible and standardized um, 
And I don't have time to go into this now, but you can find more info on GitHub or by contacting me. So to summarize, reproduce script can transform complex layered scripts and functions that are study specific into a standardized script. Researchers can thus share their analysis pipeline without having to worry about the quality of their coding style. Uh, reproduce script is already part of the field trip toolbox and is ready to be used. We're currently preparing a manuscript in which we describe it and show how it works on, re on a real life example. So for more info, please feel free to contact me and I'm happy to answer your questions.